So today we're going to continue in the world of Adobe Illustrator. We're going to talk kind of um, a lot about architecture today. And I know that there are students that are in landscape, there are students that are industrial design, uh, there are students that are just exploring just design in general. Uh, so I apologize a little bit because my lecture and what we're talking about is really focused on architectural design. But at the same time, the skills that I talk about today, this is about diagramming and how do we represent our ideas. The skills that um, we're gonna talk about today are very much in line with the skills that you would use to diagram an industrial design project or to diagram a landscape design. So when we get to the actual exercise, if you wanna pick a landscape or you wanna pick um, an industrial design object that you wanna to try to diagram, that's okay with me. Uh, but my background is much more from the architectural perspective. And as a result, the lecture is gonna be geared that direction because that's where I have my uh, area of expertise. So let me uh, go ahead and share my screen here. And give me just a second to get organized. Perfect, and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so architectural diagrams. What fundamentally is a diagram in the first place? Well, you use a diagram to explain a major design idea. So something that is, is, is what your design is centered around needs to be able to be distilled down into something that's really easy to understand. So you're simplifying that design move and making a presentation about this is what I'm intending. You're trying to provide a clear and easy to understand view of the project. Maybe you have multiple things going on and you're breaking out each of those components into just one little explanation. So it's really about communicating your idea clearly across um, either a visual realm or an audible realm. You need to be able to summarize your idea. You need to be able to show somebody one thing and have them understand what your um, work is fundamentally about. So how do you learn to diagram in the first place? Well, learning to diagram is really about practice. It's about spending a lot of time practicing and getting comfortable with drawing. A lot of diagrams start out as just hand drawings and learning how to sketch and being able to, to quickly draw out or doodle an idea, that's really fundamentally about diagramming. If you're struggling a little bit with diagramming, that's where adding color or maybe cutting out images, using a different medium, colored pencil, uh, charcoal, watercolors, that kind of stuff can work. But that's, that's just tools to help you achieve the diagram. And so I wanna focus for a while on, you know, what is the diagram? So this image was an image from a sketchbook of mine in grad school. You can't even really see what the, the content is about and some of the little notes and whatever. But I like this for two reasons. One, it shows you that I was drawing on all kinds of different pieces of paper at the time. And then I cut them out and put them in my notebook afterward, which is always a good thing. So it doesn't matter what you're drawing on. It could be a napkin. You just cut it out, tape it in your notebook. And the other thing is that it kind of shows a flow of ideas. These are all different ideas that I'm... I'm talking about, exploring, and thinking about. None of them are particularly well resolved. You don't see a building yet, but you might see little pieces of a building. And it's those little pieces that are starting to come together as I formulate these design ideas. Another example of a sketchbook, I actually moved in the direction of this sketchbook uh, because it was a folding page where it was like an accordion and I could keep drawing over, the, over across pages. Um, so it worked really nicely for me. This was my favorite kind of sketchbook. But all of these little sketches are really diagrams. They're really basic ideas. What about this? What about that? How am I going to connect this? How am I going to connect it to that? And those are all little, little pieces of ideas. So let's look at some fundamental architectural diagram types and then examples of those types, because I think diagrams tend to fall into some major categories. So in these techniques that we'll talk about, I'll talk about uh, figure ground. I'll talk about highlighting. We'll talk about arrows and flow lines. We'll talk about components. We'll use text and topography potentially. And then we'll talk about movement or flow. All of those can overlap each other. So it doesn't mean that just because you're using a figure ground, you can't use a, a highlighting or that arrows and flow lines and movement aren't kind of the same thing. It happens. 
So there is a lot of crossover in these broad categories, and you'll see that crossover in the examples that I start to show you. So let's start first with something called a figure ground. Now, maybe you've heard of the figure ground before, maybe you haven't, uh, but the figure ground has been around a long time as a, an idea, um, and it kind of came to being in the uh, kind of, uh, what is it, 1600s in Rome? I think it was 1748, sorry, uh, 1700s. Um, and this Giambattista Noli's plan of Rome was kind of the early stage of this figure ground idea. And so if we zoom in a little bit, we're going to see it a little bit closer here. And so you can, if you're familiar with Rome, you can start to recognize, right, there's the Spanish steps, um, the Piazza del Popolo, and et cetera. But as we look at this, this is fundamentally a diagram. It's not really a plan because we're not seeing the individual buildings. Let's zoom in to another level. Okay, so this happens to be the square that includes the Pantheon. So if we look at this particular plan, or I guess I should say diagram, there's something special about it. Think about what has been shaded in and what is white. This is what I mean by a figure ground or a solid and void. So in this plan of Rome, the areas that are shaded in, the solid areas, are places that you can't access as a public person. They're private residences, they might be houses, they might be businesses, whatever they are, they're places that you can't access. Places you can access, however, public spaces are shown in white. So the streets are obviously white, but so are the churches because you can walk into the churches. So it's an interesting take on Rome. Let's back out of that for just a second. Whoops, trying to go backwards, right? And look at it one step further away now that we're knowing what we're seeing. Well, it's kind of interesting. This is fundamentally a diagram of Rome that shows what's public and what's private. Interesting way of looking at it. So it's not really a plan of Rome. It's a diagram of Rome. This same technique is used very frequently today. So this is a museum. I don't even know what museum this is, but they're showing us in level one, level two, and level three, what areas are publicly accessible and what areas are backstage, what areas aren't publicly accessible, just by the color choice. The white is what we can access, the blue is what we can't. So that same technique can be used very easily in your design ideas. So this was a uh, Rem Koolhaas, his offices of metropolitan architecture. Uh, this was one of his projects. It was a library competition. And this was the library that they were designing. It was based on this idea of solids and voids within the volume of library. And so we're showing some models and stuff to get context. But these were the diagrams that came along with his library competition entry. And so if we look at this, these happen to be sections, not plans. But as we look at these sections, wall three, four, five, and six, the voids are the spaces that are the gathering places, the places you would go to read, right? They're the open places. And the dark areas, the black areas, that's where all the books are housed in the library. So we're showing the difference between the solid mass of the books and the storage of the books and the spaces that you can inhabit and interact with or collect or gather in. Then we switch to plan view. Now, obviously we have lots and lots of different uh, plan views because this is a multi-story building, but as you start to look at it, you can see those voids that we just showed showing up in the plan view as we go up level after level after level. So this solid and void or this figure ground study of diagrams is probably the best way of showing the idea behind this particular architectural project. All right, this is a, a book called The Endless City, and they use a lot of the same strategy with figure ground. Now here they're using multiple colors to try to identify it, but a few pages later, we can look at it in this figure ground study of density or public spaces, right? And then you can do diagrams of yourself. Right? You could take a particular city, you could reorganize them by regions, et cetera. So this is, again, all about diagramming. Next technique that we're going to talk about is highlighting. 
Highlighting is where you're going to highlight differences within the design framework. So you're going to accentuate differences within that design, and we're going to accent those in the diagram form. It can be done in a model, or it can be done in a drawing. Sometimes it's both. Sometimes it's kind of more like color coding, where they're putting a particular color on something so that you can see, oh, the red area is X, Y, or Z. So here's an example. The old building is colored in yellow. And then the new building is the red and the blue. So there's a difference there, right? We have the old building and the new building. So we're highlighting what those are. Here, we have a building, and we're trying to accentuate what the different programmatic areas of the building are. You have an office. You have business support facilities. You have welfare facilities, meeting facilities, management facilities, amenities, etc. So by showing the same view over and over and then highlighting the different regions, we can tell what's going on in this particular building. And that is fundamentally a diagram technique. This is a... Um, Alex Holgraf drawing or model. And again, this is kind of about highlighting differences. We're showing this view that's passing through the building. The building, by the way, let me draw on it here so we can hopefully see it a little bit better, right? That's his building right there. And so he has two views. He has view one and view two, and he's shown in diagrammatic form right there. There's view two. It's looking this way at those two towers. So if we come down here to view two, we're looking through the building at those towers in the distance. So he's using the plan and the perspective to work together to kind of highlight what's happening in this particular building. He uses a lot of color to try to accentuate what's happening and what you're looking at. The, the green is these two view corridors and we're, he's drawing attention to those two view corridors. Right. Another example here where he's contrasting a particular view or a particular axis with these color choices that are contrasting. Right. Another example here, this was a student competition. And again, I don't know too much about this particular project, but we can see that we're highlighting certain regions. Oops, there we go. Here we've got kind of the, the cut sectional perspective model. And they've used color codes to highlight all kinds of areas of this particular model. Now, for me, this is less successful. It looks more like a, uh, you know, a unicorn threw up a rainbow of colors all over this drawing. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily do that because I think it's too much color, but a little bit of color to highlight one particular area, that probably works. So there's just an awful lot going on here. And I think it would be better off if it was separated out, kind of like the, um, see if we can get my slides back here on the, no, of course, earlier when I wanted that, I can't get it. No, apparently I can't get it anymore. Hold on. Sometimes it just kills you when you can't find what you want. There we go. It is like this one. It would have been more successful if it was like this one where we're separating the drawing out into its components so we can see it rather than having them all smushed together in one, like this one. So I think this is less successful. All right, here's more examples of color coding and highlighting. I think this one was pretty good. It was a project that was done on a river and it was the in-between zone between the nature of the river and the urban of the city. And they use just two colors to kind of highlight the difference. And then the transparent or the white area in between is where the project happens. So you have the blue zone of the river and you have the red zone of the city. And it's how those two interact together. Another example here with lots of different um, drawings where we have the green roofs, then we have the offices, we have the housing, the hotel and the restaurant, the commercial space, et cetera. And then we have these combinations where you're starting to see them all assembled together. Again, these are uh, a little bit less, they get, they get distracted. But in this case, they were trying to show a difference um, as the, the market conditions might change in this building, how it might be used differently. So in this case, I think it works pretty well. Again, these are perfect opportunities to think about color theory. And maybe instead of using such contrasting colors, you use an analogous colors, where you have similar colors that are designed to kind of go together. 
uh, rather than just clash. So think color theory when you're working through some of these as well. Another example here of highlighting certain pieces of the building. Again, this is an Alex Holgraf example. Uh, and you can see those red or orange areas are really designed to highlight, hey, this particular piece versus the background. Next diagrammatic technique would be the use of arrows or flow lines. So these are accentuating movement of something. In an ideal world, they're movement of people through a particular space, but it could be movement of air through a particular space. It's, it's just signifying movement or views or something like that. I think the drawing on the right here is particularly nicely done because it's subtle. But what we do is we notice down here at the bottom that we have a certain thickness of people that are entering this particular space. So that thickness is represented by this, this line. As the line starts to go up, and actually really I should be using a different color, there we go. There's the thickness of the line. As the line starts to go up, the most of the thickness continues, but a small bit of thickness goes down the stairs that way. So this thicker line continues up to the first level, then a little bit splits off, the line gets thinner and they continue up to the next level, it splits off, et cetera where we're going up in space. So it shows this movement of people through the scene. And that's a really great way of identifying how something's happening, how something's flowing in a particular diagram. So here's a project. It's called the Floating Roof House by Takahara and Yui Tezuka. It's in Japan. And so if you were going to sit down and try to draw this, and back when I had uh, in-person class, I would make people get out a piece of paper uh, and actually draw it in their, their sketchbooks. You guys are all sitting at your computer, probably half asleep, but hopefully not. Um, but you probably don't have paper sitting around. But I ask you to think for just a second on this blank white screen, what would a floating roof house look like in diagrammatic form? Well, fundamentally, it probably would have some kind of a roof, right? So let's say it has some kind of a roof. The house is probably down here. Right, so the roof is floating. How do we accentuate that? Well, maybe we have some little arrows coming up, right? Maybe we have some arrows underneath. I don't know. Right, so there's another example. There's our roof. You know, maybe it's just the gap is enough. I don't know. You could sort through ideas. So let's see what they did. Well, their diagram was this, which is a beautiful sketch, but we can clearly see the floating roof. Right? There's that roof. It's emphasized in this page. Back it up so you can't see mine. And then the way that they showed the floating wasn't about putting arrows pointing up, but was instead about having one simple arrow run through the building. So the hillside, this all this scribble of hillside, is actually flowing through the building. And that's how we start to see this as a floating roof house. And you say, that's great. You've shown me all of the, the drawings that they've done about it. Show me what it actually looks like as it starts to get further developed. Well, here's a more de defined section. It's kind of a sectional perspective that shows the hillside. And again, we could draw that simple arrow that goes through to represent the floating roof. But let's take it a step further into the actual built house. Well, here it is. So the idea behind this house was that the roof was supposed to appear to be floating. And it has these really cool doors that close. Uh, you can see they're all pocketed and nesting. Uh, and they pull on all these tracks to close if you wanted to close it up. But it's really about letting the hillside flow right through the house. So it's a very, very different house. And I think at the same time, it's a very cool house. So you can see, and if we jump back by a couple slides here, how the diagram of the house ends up becoming reality. And there it is in its final form. So this, this one was about views across the river. So you're seeing those little red boxes and then the lines representing the views. Another example here where you've got people that are crossing across a space represented by those lightsabers or lasers, for lack of a better term. And this is what you have to be careful of when you're doing diagramming is, you know, what are the connotations of what color you choose or what they look like? To me, this looks like one of those laser mesh nets rather than people flowing across a particular space. 
Another example here where you've got this raised stage or, or scheme and you've got views going out. To me, the black arrows in this are a little bit too stark, too strong. I think they could be softened a bit uh, and you'd still get the same idea across. This one was about air flowing through a space. So the air is coming in, working its way through the space and then flowing out. My gripe is that in reality, I think because of the stack cooling effect, the cold air would come in and the hot air would go out that way. I think this, unless there was a strong breeze blowing it in this window, this going down wouldn't be very likely. But that's a technical issue. The point is we're supposed to be looking at diagrams today and these twisting arrows represent the airflow through the building. Building components. So again, all of these kind of overlap each other. And we see that we have arrows on this one. So there's, there's always an overlap, but it's emphasizing certain components of a building. How are we building up this building into its pieces? So how can we, how can we explode pieces off so that we understand what's happening? Right, so here's an example where we're taking the shell off the building. We've lifted up that fancy shell and we see what's underneath. Obviously this can't happen in reality, but in our drawing form, it gives us a really good understanding of how these components fit together. Happens to be a really beautiful drawing, too. These are structural diagrams and actually kind of a structural model about how the facade might work or how the, the building might support itself. OK, so here's one. This is the Sendai Media Tech by Toyo Ito. Now, I can't read Japanese. Maybe some of you can. I know it's a little blurry anyway. But I can tell from the diagram that this is something about a bunch of floors that are penetrated through with these kind of mesh structures. So you've got like a traditional building, but then you've got these twisting mesh structures that run up through it. Okay, so diagrammatic form, I have an understanding of what the building is about before I even see the building just by this drawing. Now, in this particular example, he did multiple um, studies. This one is like a figure ground, going back to the solid and void, Noli plan of Rome style. Here is a bunch of floor plans that are developed the same way, where we're seeing a solid and a void in diagrammatic form. Then we get to a little bit more technical drawing. Okay, now we have these floor plates that are highlighted in green. We've got a skin that gets applied to the building, and we've again got these twisting mesh structures that kind of run up through the building. So it's an interesting combination of diagrams that lead us to what the final building looks like. We develop it a little bit further. These are some structural diagrams about the kinks and the, the reinforcing and how these, these work to support the building, a little bit more technical. And then we get to the actual building itself. So this building is fundamentally about these floor plates that are punctured by these twisting metal structures. Now, it's really interesting because these twisting metal structures are designed to house all of the building utilities. And you can see it, right? Over here in this example, you can see that that's the exit stairway. You go through that door right here, and you've got the stairs shown right in here. That's the fire stair. This one is all about the elevator. So you get into the elevator, and then you go up through that core. This one is actually really interesting. It's much smaller. But notice right in here that there's a little pipe. Well, that's about building services. Could be water supply, could be fire sprinklers, could be electrical, et cetera. But that's building services. And they're all coming up through these little twisting punctured structures. Now, interestingly enough, I'm going to back up here. And I want to concentrate on this area over here, the fire stairwell. So this is one of those. It has nothing to do with what you're talking in class. But I can't talk about the Sendai Media Tech and not talk about this because it's awfully cool. And that is that um, they needed a way to make that stairway right there a fire exit. Well, notice that if there was a raging fire on one of the floors and you were walking down that stairway, you'd be exposed to the fire because you're essentially, you know, it's glass. And so you'd be on one side of the glass, but the raging fire would be on the other side of the glass. So the way that they, that they handled this was twofold. One, it's a very specialty type of glass. It has an intumescent gel inside of the panes of glass. So there's a, a layer of glass on one side, and then there's a layer of glass on the other side. And in between, is filled with a clear gel that resists heat and fire. Very cool product. Okay, so that's one thing. Now, the second part is that that gel 
can you can choose to have it remain clear when exposed to heat, or you can choose to have it turn foggy when it's exposed to heat. And so in this scenario, they put the gel in that turns foggy so that people wouldn't panic as they were walking past a raging fire on one of the floors. To my knowledge, there's never been a fire, so it's never actually happened. But that's how building materials can really play into these kinds of uh, building examples. It's really interesting. I know it was a sidebar and not necessarily relevant to what we're talking about today. But at the same time, I wanted to. I couldn't talk about this building and not talk about that fact. So here it is from the outside. So you can really clearly see these strong floor plates that are going up. And you can see the twisting structures as they run through the building providing the services to the building. So the diagram is very much representative of what the end product becomes. Right? Another example here of structural flexing, and et cetera. Here's an example that's like kind of an exploded axonometric where they've broken the building into different pieces. You've got an elevator core, and then you've got the certain towers. You've got a land bridge, et cetera. Another example here where you've got these jewels that are floating inside the box. You've got these colored shapes that are floating inside. So just different, different ways I'm kind of highlighting. Here is a structural grid system on the outside of the building, kind of how that was developed. Thermal systems diagram. Again, this one is, was a stack cooling. You let the cool air in the bottom, you let the hot air out the top. The Pantheon. It's a very famous building in Rome. Actually, I would say if you ever go to Rome, this is an absolute must. You have to go here. And what I would ask that you do, go here, plan to take like 45 minutes and just sit. Just sit in the space. It's like nothing you've ever experienced before. It's 2,000 years old. It was the largest dome that was ever built until the widest, excuse me, I should say not the tallest, the widest dome that was built uh, for almost 2,000 years. It wasn't surpassed until 1946. It's pretty cool. Built by the Romans, uh, 118 AD. Anyway, when it comes to a diagram, the interesting thing about this building is that a perfect sphere can fit inside it. It's exactly 150 feet from the floor to the top of the ceiling, and it's exactly 150 feet wide across the middle there to there. So if you put a sphere in this building, it would fit perfectly. And so as a result, this is a great diagram of it because we see that sphere very clearly. I have to show a few pictures of it just so you have an understanding of scale. I think the hardest thing is that when we talk about it, it's hard to understand how big a person really is until we show a picture like this, right? So notice that the people in here, you know, the heads of the people are no taller than the bottom of that first niche. And if we jump back a few slides to where we have that diagram, the bottom of that first niche is right there. So that's a person. It's a huge space. And actually, we can see the little person right there. But that's the critical thing to understand is how massive this space is, like something uh, that you're not used to seeing. Sometimes you might have two diagrams that work together where you have a day and a night cycle. This is what it looks like during the day. This is what it looks like at night and how that changes over time. Then we move into a diagrammatic technique called topography. And this is where you're using text to talk about what an intended use of a particular building was or uh, how, that, the, how the building, you know, a component of the building, et cetera. I think this is a great example. Again, Alex Holgraf here, using text to kind of understanding what's happening. So we've got these sections. He has it labeled as entry option one, two, and three. And he's using text to, to identify what's happening in each of these spaces. And by the text, you can kind of give a sense for how grand something might be or how big something might be, et cetera. And so you can use typography in the same strategy. It's still diagrammatic. Obviously, there aren't giant letters that say stage on the stage, but it gives us a sense of what's happening in this particular Right? This one was a library, a section of a library. And so these texts identify what's happening in those particular regions of the library. So there's nothing wrong with using text as a diagram and technique. 
This one is a little bit of a departure from that, but I, I use these little plus signs as kind of like text where they're creating relationships between the near and the far. So we have these little dashes that are in certain places, and then we have the little plus signs in the kind of regional horizon, et cetera. And then we have movement. And this one kind of overlaps with the arrows and flow lines, but it's about seeing how people move through space over time. And so this can be done in color, right? In this example, we have all the various floors and they're being color graded. Or it might be about showing you know, lines or arrows or dots moving through a particular space. I like this one a lot. And the good news is nobody can spoil this because we're all on Zoom, but does anybody recognize what this is? Well, think about it. I'm gonna show a video next. Let's see if it decides to play here. There we go. So I know this is old, 2010, but you can see all these dots start to move. That should give you some idea of what's happening. So this is back before Uber and Lyft came onto the scene. This was just tracking taxi cabs. And so you could see in diagrammatic form, just by tracking the taxi cabs, you can get a map of the city. Furthermore, the density of the lines represent the more trafficked routes or the denser areas, and the less dense lines represent the less trafficked areas. So not only do we get an understanding of what this is, that it's a city, but also how frequently certain routes are traveled. Now, hopefully by this point, you're kind of recognizing that this is the city of San Francisco. And in the city of San Francisco, right, the downtown, the dense area, Market Street, et cetera, is that big black chunk in the upper right corner. And then we've got some wings. We've got the Bay Bridge extending out. We've also got a big thick line heading down to the, toward the airport on the peninsula. And so just through this view of over time, this is one day, it's about to wrap up. It's one day. Uh, of work, we have an awfully good map of the city of San Francisco. Now, it's nice that this one's interactive because you can kind of see it develop over time, but you certainly get the idea. I'm going to go ahead and move on. So using that same strategy, this was one of the diagrams that came out of my uh, thesis project, it had to do with flight patterns uh, from SFO. This was, at the time, SFO. Um, Again, this was a diagram that I drew. It was a bunch of little dots charting how people th moved through particular spaces and, and were in particular queues. You could see those snaking lines that represent certain queues, et cetera. And at the time, uh, Terminal 2, which is now over here, was closed. So we didn't have anything coming out of Terminal 2, just a few people walking between the two. These little T's were those air train stations where people were crossing over into the air train stations. So just an interesting take on what was happening in uh, SFO through how people move through the space. There it is a little bit closer. So you can use that same. This was a view diagram that was done in plan where it was the angles that would afford privacy in this, this pool at the end. So if you were walking in, you couldn't see past that corner until you got to this corner and then you couldn't see around this corner until you got to that corner. So it was a way of affording privacy with no doors. This was a site diagram. We have an understanding that there's a river, there's probably some trees, and that whatever this colored region is, that's where the site would be. This one, I had to include it because this, is, this was, we were asked to diagram our thesis. Uh, this is when we were first starting out our thesis. And so this first card, that was what I thought my thesis was. I had a pretty good solid idea of what I was gonna do. And then, <laughs> Uh, as I started to work on researching it, that became what my thesis was. It was a big tangled mess. So just kind of an interesting take on thesis. Uh, this is, again, movement through space. They're showing it via dotted lines this time. And then how it developed into a particular um, mass or building. Again, those dotted lines going through that particular space. This one had to do with sun movement, solar orientation, shading devices, et cetera, but we see that. 
Uh, this one is, to me, always kind of corny, and I think it has to do with the sun. There's just something about the sun that ends up being really corny. Uh, but this was about evaporation and cooling and heating of this green space um, and condensation and, and whatever. I think if it wasn't so clip art -y, it would be a much nicer drawing, but this is what it's about. All right, the last technique that we'll talk about is the transformation technique. This is a, this is what it usually is. This is what we're going to do now. So, or what if we take this the normal way and what if we did this? So it's usually a combination of two. So typically we have this, the back of house, we have the chamber and we have the front of house. What if we changed it and became above the house, chamber and below the house? So it's typically what if. Um, and you can show these. Okay, here's another example. This is our box. We cut it up, we reassemble it, and we flip the pieces around, and that gives us a new shape. So this is one of those we're transforming, and we're showing it through a series of images. Uh, Alana, you're asking, how did you get your data? Oh, for the, the I'm guessing for SFO? If that's correct, yes. I, I, I spent way too much time at the airport. I had okay. to, I had to, I had to sit there and watch people with a notepad, and this is what you get for thesis, right? I'd go there, I'd take photos, and I'd sit and watch, and I'd draw. Was some of it adapted? Yes. You know, did I put GPS trackers on people? No, but it was based on the idea. So was it approximate? Yes, but did it get a pretty good idea? Absolutely. And did did I do multiple ones where they were over time? Like you know, did I go back every three months and see how it changed? No. Uh, you only have so much time, but I did spend at least a couple days in the airport wandering around uh, looking at things and drawing. And the funny part, the funny part of my thesis is I never actually intended to do a thesis on a project that was that scale. I've never been interested in large scale projects. I've always been interested in, in more of the residential scale. Um, and the way that thesis just kind of evolved, I needed a bigger space to 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 work through what I was trying to work through. So I ended up in an airport. Go figure. All right. Okay. And so that's it for those slides. So now we're going to move from the slide presentation over into what we're doing today uh, in our exercise 116. So let me close those down. So in exercise 116, I'm going to ask that you find two images uh, that are of an existing building or project. If you want to use one of your own buildings or projects, you absolutely can use one of your own. However, if you want to pick uh, an example uh, online, that's perfectly fine for me. Uh, part one, I'm asking you to select a building, right? This is, again, you're picking a, a building. I'd like you to look for a plan and a section because diagrams work really well in plan and they work really well in section. A lot of times in section, they have to do with light and how light enters a space. And in plan, they have to do with how people move around a space. So those tend to work really well. I'm asking you to pick one of each. Um, and then we're going to diagram it. If you're not an architect or you're not interested in architecture and you want to try to diagram an industrial design project or you want to try to diagram a landscape, I'm okay with you attempting it to shift it a little bit. There's nothing that says you have to work with a building, but I think a lot of times it's easier to work with a building. So as we start to do this, we need to find a building. So this is where I'd go into Google image search. I'd say images.google.com. And then it would be about picking a particular building. So for example, the Pantheon, right? I can look at that. Those are gonna bring up all the Pantheon images. I would want Pantheon section, for example, right? And then we start to look at Pantheon section. You can already see some people that have been doing diagrams. Any one of these would work to kind of represent the Pantheon as an idea. The, you could pick a different building. So that was a Pantheon. How about um, the Kimball Art Museum? Kimball Art Museum, right? It's this building right here. Uh, it's kind of a very famous study in light and how light enters a particular space. These are the these galleries. This is all natural light that comes through a skylight that gets diffused. So it's really about soft light entering the space. So it's a great one to diagram as well. So if I did Kimball Art Museum, I would look for a section, for example. And then we would get uh, an example of a section. You can see that some of them already have uh, light filled in around these. But we're looking for something like this that would have kind of a basic drawing. 
So if I find something like this, I'm going to want to save it, right? So let's go to the actual, see if we can get down here, right? Early sketches. All right, so here we are. I'm gonna save this image. Let's save image as. And let me put it on my flash drive. Demonstrations. And I could drop it in here. We'll click save. And so since we, I mentioned the Pantheon, mentioned the Kimball Art Museum, again, you could pick any different drawing that you wanted. You could even go on the Arch Daily site. And they've got a bunch of projects. Uh, they also, I believe, have a classics section. Uh, no, they have a lot of good stuff. Uh, where's their classic section? Of course, I can't find it. Top 100. How about that? So these are a bunch of, of different projects and you can pick any one of these. You can work from a photograph or you can work from a drawing. All right, so just more examples. Again, if you wanna pick mine, if you wanna do the Kimball Art Museum, you wanna do the Pantheon, let me get a plan of the Pantheon. I'll do that as my plan. Here we go, let's get this one. There we go, let me right click and say, oops, save image as, there we go. And we'll save it right into the same folder. Okay, so now we need to open those in Illustrator. So let me go ahead and open up Illustrator. There we go. Maybe, there we go. And we're going to work on diagramming. I'm going to start with a new letter size piece of paper. It's working slowly today. Perfect. And I'll go to file and then place. And I'm going to drop in there that, um, that first drawing that I have. And I can't find anything this morning. All right, so let's start with that Kimball Art Museum. And I'll go ahead and click on place. And that'll let me drop my drawing into this uh, image. Now, unlike InDesign, I can just go ahead and scale it to make it show up the full size of the page. Now, I don't want to squish it. So I'm going to hold down Shift to keep it in proportion right about like that. So this is obviously a, a very technical drawing of what's happening in a particular scene. So I only need to kind of adapt it. So I'm gonna go over into my layers right here. So I've clicked on the layers button. I'm gonna come down to the bottom and add a layer. I now have layer two and let me rename it. We'll call this diagram. Okay, then I'll make it the active layer by selecting it. And I'll go ahead and I'll lock layer one so that I can't select it or move it. So I'm working on the diagram layer. Layer one is locked. And ultimately, I could turn it off once I kind of simplify it. And now I need to trace over part of this drawing to kind of fill it in. So let's go ahead and I'll use the pen tool. And I'm going to get some um, preliminary work here. Let's go to right there. And I'm just going to end it right here. I'm only concerned with with one of these galleries, we'll come over to right there. And then we'll come up and finish it. There's one piece. Now I need to trace over this upper part. So let me press control plus twice so I can kind of zoom in on this. And we'll say, we'll start right there. We'll come over there. 
I'll pick a point in the middle so that I can start to create that arc. And I'll finish it right there. Again, I'll pick a point right about in the middle. Drag it out to create the top part. And then we'll come down to that point there. Didn't quite get it perfect. So I'm going to have to come back in with my white arrow, my direct select. I'll pick this point and I'll extend this a little bit longer to establish that. This one I actually think needs to get a little bit shorter. Yeah, right about there. Okay, so I have this half, which is pretty good. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy that half and paste it over on the other side. So I'll take this, we're gonna go up to edit, copy, and then edit, paste. And then I wanna reflect it. So I'll right click on it and then choose uh, transform and then we'll reflect. We want to reflect it in the vertical direction. We'll say, okay, there it is. Now I can drop it over on this side of the building. So reasonably close. So now if I were to turn off layer one, we can see that I have already a pretty good kind of base of what's happening here. The last piece that I need are these little reflective scoops. So I need to draw those in. We'll come right there. And we'll end right there. And again, I'm going to flip this so that it's just the line. And then we'll do the same thing on the other side. Like that. Then I'll come back with the white arrow and make some adjustments to make that match. So I have those two as their scoops now. And if I wanted to, I could draw that last little bit, you know, right there to there. And then I could put that little circle at the bottom. Again, if I wanted to, something like that. So now if I were to turn it off, we have pretty much the shape of the building. Okay, And maybe they need some little tweaking and whatever, but we get the idea. So now as we start to move forward, and I guess maybe I should have called this, instead of diagram, I should have called this base drawing. I can create a new layer for my diagram. So I'll type in diagram. And now I want to think about what's important about this space. Well, really, it's a lot about how light enters the space. And so I could show this light in a variety of ways. First off, I could just do it with a basic arrow. So I could start with the pen tool, I could have the light come in, hit this, reflect, and then come down into the space. So let's say something like that. Okay, now I need that to end up looking more like light or an arrow or whatever. So let's look at what properties we can do to change to make this feel right. So we can go over into properties here. And number one, I could make the stroke bigger. So I can make this fatter. Okay, and maybe I need to make some tweaks because it's kind of running into and colliding with some stuff. So I might adjust it a little bit. Maybe that's too thick. Number two, I could change the color. So right now it's black, but I could change the color to be kind of a light color, something like that. Okay, so that helps. I could draw an arrow at the end. I could come down here and say, this is now going to be an arrow. And let me, sorry, I should have drawn the other side as well. Right, I could draw something like that. I did not want that to be a sharp point. Hold on a second. It looks goofy right now. So let's change that. I'm going to open up the stroke palette and I'm going to change the corner to be clipped. So it's more like that. Okay, so I could draw something like that. I could also take this and I could make it semi-transparent. I could come over here to the opacity and I could say, let's drop that opacity down because it's shining through. Maybe that's a good idea. But I have some other options. So let's come back here for a second. I'm gonna delete that anchor point. 
And I'll delete that line there. And let's look at this line again, right here. Well, under stroke here, I can also come down and I can look at the arrowheads. So I have an arrow at the, the start of my line and I have an arrow at the end. And so I could actually pick any one of these arrows. Oops, sorry, I thought I was, would be this side. And I can put an arrow in, an arrowhead. So that one looks pretty corny, but you get the idea of what I could do. Sometimes the dot is useful, more like a leader. The one I have a tendency, don't, please don't do that. Right? <laughs> we don't need the hand pointer. Uh, the one I have a tendency to use is one of these very plain ones like this. To me, this one looks awfully good and it, it allows us to set up our, our line. Our scales look good. We can adjust the scale of the arrow. If you wanted the arrow to be bigger or smaller, you can drop, right? That was a thousand percent. That was not my intent. I was trying to go to 200, right? You can make the arrow bigger if you wanted to. Um, I don't have a tendency to adjust those. I try to just leave them at 100%. So you can do that. We also have the ability to work with our profiles. Remember before where we could start fat, sorry, we could start fat and get thinner. As we entered the space, we could have it get bigger in the middle. That's another bigger in the middle. So you can work with the shape tool to create those profiles. I find the, um, and again, I have to flip it. I find this where it starts bigger and gets thinner sometimes to be very, very effective. And in that case, maybe you bump up the size and maybe we turn off the arrow. Maybe we don't like the arrow anymore. Right, come up here to none. And now it's the, the reflection makes the, the overall piece a little bit smaller. So there's just different strategies that get to what's happening. So that's one strategy where you're showing this through um, the shape. Now, we could also do it where it's like a fill region, where we're doing a, like a, a gradient. And so in that case, we'd actually have to draw our shape. So I, again, I'm doing it for half, though you would probably do this for all of it, right? I'd come down here and I'd kind of roughly trace this shape. Again, we might have to, to make some adjustments here, right? And then we'd come down, oops. Hold on, I messed it up. Okay, sorry, I continued on. I'm gonna just have to draw next to it so that I don't end up connecting the dots here. So just bear with me. All right, so we'll do one here that's like this. And we'll end right there. And then this will come over that way. And we'll come over kind of close to that. And we'll kind of trace this up. Okay, so right now, this doesn't look like much because it's just kind of a, a shape here. But if we flip it so that it's filled and then we made some adjustments to it. So I took this and, and adjusted this so that it had a little bit better arc there, kind of filled it in. Likewise, I could fill that one in a little bit better. This one would come down, this one would come down. This would get a little bit bigger. See, I'm filling it in the region here. This would come over and this would come over like that, right? I'm, I'm essentially, I'm filling this in. Then we can use our gradient tool, right? We can come over to our gradient tool and create a gradient. Let me open window and then gradient. And whoops, we don't want a gradient on, we want a gradient on the fill like that, but I want it to go, so it's vertically, so we'll go to 90 here, so it's going down, and I want it to go, instead of this black color, right, I want the yellow color, so I want it to go from yellow, that's kind of an ugly yellow, how about that yellow, there we go, to, in this case, maybe not white, maybe I want it to become transparent, so I take that, and I go to 0% opacity, 
right? And now it's going from solid to transparent. Just a different strategy to kind of show it. Oops, let me get rid of the fill. And now you can see that the light is theoretically coming in and then diffusing out as it goes through the space. Just a different way of kind of showing the same thing. And whether you want to show it in arrow form or whether you want to show it in kind of this form, either one is perfectly acceptable. I'm just showing you different strategies for kind of representing these ideas. Now, what about, let me go to new here. What about in plan? So let me bring in that Pantheon. Let me go to file and then place. I'll bring in the Pantheon now. There it is. This one's really big, so we need to make it a little bit smaller. Again, I'm going to hold down shift to make sure it maintains its proportions. And now it fits on the page. Now in this one, I don't really want to trace over the whole thing because it's a lot of work to trace over the whole thing. So I'll use this as a backdrop, but then I'm going to diagram over the top of it. And what I may find is that I want to take this and I want to um, change the opacity of this drawing down. So I can come in here with the opacity and I can make it not quite so strong. Okay, that may be something that you want to do to help de-emphasize it. So let's go into our layers. I'm going to create a new layer again, and I'm going to lock layer one so that I can't accidentally select it. And then we're going to look at how people move through the space. So this is where I would be using the pen tool again to essentially draw how somebody might move through the space. Right, so I, I draw my way through. They're going to come through into the, the door here. I don't want it to be filling, so let's get rid of the fill. And then they might say, you know what, let me walk over and see this niche. And I'll kind of walk along here. And then, you know what, I want to come all the way across to over here. I'm just going to cut straight across. And then we'll keep kind of working along here. So you're imagining how somebody would walk through the space. And then, you know, maybe they're going to walk right to the center because they want to look up at the space. And then they'll continue on their way and go out the door. And maybe they have to go off this way. And so like I did with my drawing, the best thing to do would be to actually be in the place, in the Pantheon, and watch people walk through the space because then you'd have a really good idea of where they actually go. But for right now, we're just kind of approximating it. And so I've created this line that represents how somebody moves through the space. So let's look at what can we do with this line? Same thing, we can come over here into our properties, we can go into our stroke, we can change the thickness, we can do arrowheads, we can change the profile, but we can also go into what's called brushes. So I'm gonna go into window and I'm gonna open up brushes right here. And there are some brushes that are loaded by default. Some of them are like calligraphy brushes where they get thick and thin which is kind of nice. Right? There's another one like that. So that's a strategy. Some of them are like charcoal where they fade in or fade out. There are a bunch of brushes in here. So if we go into open brush library, you could see that there's arrows, there's artistic, calligraphy, ink, paintbrush, watercolor, you name it. So here's a bunch of watercolor brushes, for example. You could pick a watercolor. Um, and obviously that would show up better if I had a color instead of black. So let's make it red, for example, so you can see it, right? We can watercolor something. Now, maybe those aren't turning out well. So we could easily switch, go to open brush library, and we can say, you know what? Let's go back to our uh, artistic. Let's go back to our paintbrush. Let's see what one of those would look like. Right. So all different strategies. So you can play around with what those brushes look like. Again, this is really thick. You might need to thin it down so we can go down so that it's not so thick. And we see it that way. Different, different strategy. So those brushes exist. Now, what about if you want to show like a bunch of little dots or footsteps going through a particular page? Well, we can create a dotted line back in the stroke menu. And we'd probably go back to just a, a regular uh line without the brush anymore so let's go back up here and we'll just edit it so let me go into stroke here we can do dash line right this is where we can choose our dashes how big they are this looks like actually a little 
Uh, let's go back to a basic line. And let me increase these a little bit. so You can hopefully see it. Yeah, there's our dashes. And we can actually specify this is a 12 point dash. We could do a one point dash with a one point break. And in that scenario, it probably should be a three point or a one point width. And then if we zoomed in here, that was the wrong key command. Arr, sorry. Mac problems. No. Can I hit the correct key for once? Right? So you can see that little dashed line that we're creating. If we want it to be longer, we could say that we want a two point dash and a one point. So you see how we're working to create that flow. Now we can also customize this. So let's say we wanted to show footsteps going through a particular page. So if we wanted to show footsteps, we would need to draw the footsteps first. So let me come in here, let me draw some footsteps. And I should probably zoom in so you guys can see me do this. I, that's going to kill me today. All right, there's one. All right, so let's say that that's a footstep. Actually, that's a terrible footstep. I need to add an anchor point. All right, so let's say that's a footstep. All right, it might not be the best looking footstep in the world. I'm going to take that, we're going to copy it. So control C and control V to paste. And then I'm going to reflect it. So I'll right click transform and I'm going to reflect it. This time it's going to be horizontal. Okay. So I'm creating a second footstep. So something about like that. So you could do this with dog paws. You can do it with footsteps, anything like that. And then what you'll do is you'll select those two objects and you'll drag them over here into the brushes palette. So I'll come right over here into the brushes. And it's going to ask me what kind of brush I want to create. Uh, we're going to do a scatter brush. We'll go ahead and say, OK. And this is where we can choose things like, is the size going to change? No. Is the spacing going to change? No. Uh, is the rotation going to change? Yes, we want it to be uh, fixed, but we want our rotation relative to the path. And the rest of these options are all fine. Once we do that, we'll see it shows up here. I'm going to go control minus, and then I can select my path. Oops, that was not what I wanted. Sorry. Space bar to pan. I'll select my path. And then if I pick my footprints, it's now going to have the footprints going on the path. Let me do control zero. There you go. Repeating themselves. OK, OK going through the space with all the little footprints. So it's just a different strategy. Uh, not You don't have to do it, but sometimes seeing those little dots is useful. So you can make that out of anything. You can make dots. You could make uh, dog paws. You can make a whole bunch of different things. Um, and sometimes when you start to layer these up, these can be interesting. So then you would draw in here, and you draw another whole other set of footsteps that were coming through the space. Then I would take that and I'd do the same thing with footsteps. And pretty soon you have a density map of where people are moving through the space. Again, just another strategy. So there's one more thing that I want to show you. I know I'm almost out of time, but this is an important one. Um, as you move forward into your Charlie Harpers uh, and your drawings, a lot of people will run into this part of the equation. I'm going to do a new layer, right? And that's where you've you've traced something. So in this case, uh, I don't want to spend the time tracing the Pantheon, but what I'll do is I'll just draw some lines 
Uh, let's go on layer three here. And I really want these lines to be just normal basic lines. Okay, so there's a line. Oh, come on, there we go. There's another line. There's another line. There's a line. There's a line like that. You know what, let's draw a circle in here like that. Let's draw another circle down here. And let's draw a rectangle over here. Okay, so I've just really quickly drawn some, some lines, okay? Rectangle circles and whatever. What if I want to fill particular regions in particular colors? You know, I want to fill this in a particular color. I want to fill that in a particular color. Um, that's something that right now you don't know how to do, right? We could certainly, we could fill the circle. I could say, oh, let's fill the circle, but I want to fill only part of it. So what we can do is we can use something called the live paint tools. And what I recommend before you do a live paint, you need to duplicate the layer so that you have a backup copy. So all of these are currently on my layer three. What I'll do is I'll go ahead and make a copy of layer three. I'll duplicate it. I'll turn everything off. And then I'm going to work only with the layer three copy, just in case something were to go wrong. So I have layer three copy. I will then select all of the objects. Then I'll go up to object. I'll go to live paint and then make. So it's object, live paint, make. That makes what's called a live paint group. You see the, the boxes around the outside of my group have changed. They have a little star in them. And then I can use the live paint tool, which of course isn't shown here. Um, if we switched into the Essentials Classic workspace, it would be shown. But it is, uh, let's see, it is, draw. where is it? Paint, it is this one right here, the live paint bucket. You can press K to get to it. That's the key shortcut. I'm going to go ahead and drag it up here into my toolbars so that I have it up there. So I'm going to pick the live paint bucket tool. Now, with the live paint bucket tool selected, you'll see that I can fill in any region that is completely contained with lines. So I can't fill in out here because there's no outer line. There's no outer border. But I can fill in any one of these regions. So I could start by picking a particular color, say it's blue. And I don't want there to be uh, an outline. And then I can come in here and I could paint. Oops. Oh, come on. Let me just paint it first. Blue. Really? Why is it not changing? So pleasant. All right, come on. Go to my live paint. There we go. Just didn't want to change. Change to blue. And now I can paint that in, in blue. Uh, ultimately, I don't want there to be a stroke. So I should have been able to turn the stroke off. But it looks like it doesn't want to play nice with me right now. So then I can pick a different color, pick green. And I could fill that in in green. So the point is that you can fill in. If you have a line drawing, you can use live paint to fill any region in as you start to work with it. And then you can just change your color to be whatever the appropriate color is. And then you can paint that particular region in. So I wanted to make sure that I told you about that tool. Now, if you realize after the fact, you know what? I really wanted to paint the outside here. You may have to go back draw a little bit more around your object. And again, I'm going to flip that so that it has just an outline on it. And then you can add it to the live paint group. So I could take that line. I could select everything. I can go up to object, live paint, and I could choose merge. That'll add it to the live paint. Then I could come back and I could go into my live paint tool. And we can pick a different color. And I could come in and I could paint the other regions that I wanted in that color. Okay. The 
the strokes of those lines can all be transparent. So I don't need to have that line anymore. Let's select them all. And I can say, I don't want them to have any color. And then it's only the fill colors. Okay, so I wanted to make sure that I told you about that. I know you guys have to go. I'm sorry I talked a little bit long today. Um, we'll take about a 10 minute break or so. Uh, let's come back at, uh, well, let's take eight minutes because that's a round number. We'll come back at 920 for our check-ins. Remember this week, because Monday's class was canceled, there's no attendance requirement for check-ins. So check-ins are 100% optional. So I'm here if you need me, but if not, you don't have to come this week. Thank you guys all for, for lecture and I'll talk to you guys next week.